like sea billows roll. Whatever my life thou hast taught me to say, it is well. Okay, that countdown's a little off, y'all. Sorry for that. Uh, we'll fix it. <laughs> we'll fix it on the next run. Um, but welcome and good morning. We have a great worship plan for us all this morning. Uh, invite your neighbors or all of Facebook for a watch party. Uh, thanks for joining the Ventura Church of Christ as we are gathered yet scattered people. Uh, we know that worship puts us before the throne of God. And in that place, we join the great cloud of witnesses, the saints of all time, in unified worship of Jesus, the Lamb of God. Now would be a good time to share your prayer requests in the response below or text them to me or Donna. Uh, also, please do prepare your communion or whatever you have representing communion as best you can. Uh, we want God to build his kingdom here in our hearts, in our city, our nation, and our world. Sing loud today and share your thoughts as we worship. Be interactive, connect with those joining us. Come 
Welcome to the Ventura Church of Christ. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for this time that we could get together electronically, that we could come together and hear a lesson from your word and listen to songs and sing songs of praise to you. God, we'd ask that you would be with us wherever we're at, that we would uh, be well. God, help us, watch over us, be with the doctors and all the medical professionals that are working to get us through this time of pandemic. God, help us to uh, be back to the normal as soon as we can, whatever that is. God, help us to put our trust and faith in you, that we would lean on you during this time, to know that you are our hope, you are our, our rock, that no matter ha what happens, that you will deliver us in the end, and we will be with you forever. God, thank you for your Son, our Savior. God, help us to stay on the path. Help us to be in your word, to put you on every day as we go out. Show Christ to those around us. Be with us now as we continue to worship you every day as we go out, or if we stay in, that we put you on, on in our lives, and show you in what we do. God, pick us up when we fall down. Put us back on the path. Be with us in Jesus' name. <laughs> 
Amen. God's unchanging hand. We all have mental images of the last days of Christ's life and his resurrection. We view the events of suffering, pain, and joy filtered by our own experiences. In times when our lives seem to be completely out of control, we falter. How do we act? How do we plan? How do we live during these times? Whether it is personal or family tragedy, or a more widespread crisis that encompasses all of these things and more, our images of Christ's suffering and the resurrection do not change. Now is the time to focus on these unchanging images, these truths. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper today, let's view the hand of Christ as it reaches down from the cross. Let's view the hand of Christ as it extends out to us from the tomb. Let's view the hand of Christ as he walks the earth, beckoning us to follow. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this bread that represents the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. He joins us here, he breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Let's continue to pray. Thank you, Father, for this fruit of the vine, which represents the continually cleansing blood of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. 
This is a convenient time to think about the financial needs of the church and its members. Its needs and the needs of its members <clears throat> continue. Due to the present circumstances, many may not be able to contribute as usual. I don't need to tell you that that's okay. If anyone needs help on this level, <clears throat> please let Andrew know or let one of the elders know. For those able to contribute, you may mail checks or send your contribution electronically. Pray with me. Father, we're so blessed in so many ways. We thank you for the spiritual blessings of life, and we also thank you, Father, for the very basics of life, our food, clothing, our homes. And we pray that you would be with all of those who have special needs. And we pray for the work of the church here in Ventura. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning once again, or good afternoon, depending on where you're watching from. But uh, I do hope you're being blessed this morning through this gathering. Uh, we are gathered yet scattered, and we still celebrate the risen Savior. Uh, we are celebrating that all the way through our lives. And the communion we just participated in reminds us of that as well. But as we think about this celebration of the risen Savior, we're talking today about Jesus walks. Um, the idea from Luke 24, verses 13 through 35, that Jesus walks with his disciples, not just then, but today as well. And 
The difficulty is that we often walk in sorrow <clears throat> and we don't recognize that Jesus walks with us. So today I want to encourage you to consider how Jesus walks with us in our sorrow and then shows us how to live that out in a healthier, better way. Um, and as we do that, we want to be more like the risen Jesus as well. Um, th there's, the, there's the sorrow, but there's also the joy that we know comes after we are fully embracing the kingdom mentality. So today we're looking at um, Luke chapter 24, and we're going to start in verse 13. <clears throat> and if you'd like to open your Bibles there. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. Now this picture has uh, two men, but some scholars believe it was two women, because one of them will be named later Cleopas, and his wife was Mary. And it's possible that it was Mary and Clopas or Cleopas, John 19 shows Clopas, and you know, sometimes they write things differently, but <clears throat> it's, it's possibly a man and a woman walking down a road together, heading out. So, but that same day, that day, that resurrection Sunday is when these guys were walking, or this guy and this girl. And they were walking from where? About seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. So they were going from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and in seven miles is about the distance. So how long is that? Well, that could take you about two hours if you walk at a decent pace. And remember, these people walked all the time. It was what they did. It was just normal for them to walk and walk and walk and to continue walking because that's how they got everywhere unless they were rich and they had a donkey or a horse or a camel. But <clears throat> they walked and walked. And as they walked, <clears throat> and talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Why? Because maybe it was his resurrection body, a, a new way of understanding and seeing the world. And yet you also have to remember, <coughs> pardon me, that these guys were, uh, these people, this, this, these two disciples, they were wrapped up in their grief. They were shocked, they were destroyed. You'll remember that there's stages of grief and they were going through those stages right now, right here. And they're, they're still not understanding what happened that the tomb was found empty. They'll talk about that, but, but they still haven't recognized it, seen it for themselves and fully uh, believed in that. And so even watch as their language comes out. So, but Jesus asks them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. And one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Now, this is an interesting idea because here's Cleopas saying to him, uh, You don't know what happened? This is earth-shattering news for so many people. It, it's, it's, it's befuddling. But here's the other. Cleopas might be looking at this person walking with them, not recognizing him as Jesus and thinking, this might just be a spy. Because if you kill the leader, who do you kill next? All the followers. So not only was their, their idea of a kingdom destroyed, they were brought down from this idea of Jesus going to be the king to now he's defeated. Like, I thought he was supposed to overcome the world and destroy this, and now, boom, he's dead. And oh, do I need to fear for my life? Oh, no, who is this person? Could it be that he is a spy and here to capture me and take me in and, and crucify me too? Oh, I don't, I don't know. But Jesus asks, what things? What, 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 what is this that you're talking about? And so they decide to share about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. So everybody that knew and heard about this guy, I mean, this is a summation of the gospel. It's a powerful message, very simple, but it's in a negative frame. <clears throat> the, the, the person sharing this is saying, well, you know, he was, he was a prophet. He did have power. He did amazing miracles. We know God was with him. 
But the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped. We had hoped. Our hope is gone. We have nothing. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. So it's a very strange thing. <clears throat> it's been three days. We had thought this was happening, but it didn't. We had, we had thought that he was going to save us. And now look, he, he's, he's nowhere to be found. In, in addition, well, and plus, here's some more stuff. Some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. So here's that confirmation that those men they thought they saw were, were angels. They said, no, these, these were angels. And, and the angel said he was alive, but we, uh, we haven't seen him yet. Um, then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. So double confirmation, Jesus isn't in the tomb. He's risen, but wh what are we doing? Where, where is he? We still haven't seen him. And Jesus says to them, how foolish you are. How would you like that? It's how foolish, how foolish you are? Really, Jesus? And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Well, ugh, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Jesus is saying, look, you should have seen this coming. This has been coming for a long time. And here's how long it's been coming. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So he started in the Garden of Eden and he walked through to the Chronicles because that's the Hebrew Bible and that's the order they put it in. And all the way at the end is Chronicles. And it's this message of hope that, well, there's a Savior coming, right? There's this Savior coming. He will come. And when he comes, what, what's going to happen? He's going to suffer. That's Isaiah, the prophet, right? He says he will suffer. And so he will suffer and enter his glory. Now, here's the other. Jesus opened up all the scriptures. How long would that take for you and I? Quite a while. We'd probably want to reference some of them. But remember, Jesus is trained as a rabbi, you might say. He's been studying the scriptures and memorizing and, and just eating them, feasting on them for his whole life. And so here he is as a full-fledged rabbi, but more, who is dead, buried, resurrected, and now the eternal son of God. Um, he's saying, look, I've, I've got the scriptures right here, and I want to walk you through them. Here it is from Genesis all the way to Chronicles. I want to show you this is what was going to happen. So this is, this is the right thing. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Now this is a communion, uh, a communion verbiage. It shows up again and again throughout Luke and Acts. And John Mark Hicks wrote a great book on this, um, Come to the Table. And he says, every time you see this arrangement where uh, he took the bread, he gave thanks. Well, he blessed the bread or he gave thanks to God and he blessed God and he broke it. And then he began to give it to them. You see this same enactment um, in the feeding of the four and 5,000. You see it again um, in Acts where the people are celebrating communion. You see it at other times. It shows up. Look for this again and again, and you will see it. And here's the strange part, though. In verse 31, then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This has us going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, to the Garden of Eden, where they ate, their eyes were opened, and they were open to sin and death. And that is what came to them, sin and death, Adam and Eve. And, and we've been living in that ever since. But here, when we take the communion, our eyes are open and we're open to life and health and eternity with Jesus. And that brings us great joy. But then Jesus disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, 
were not our hearts burning within us while we talked, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us. And this is another interesting thing that here it is in your time of suffering, Jesus comes to you and helps you to understand what it is all about. And then he explains to you how to deal with life. And then he reveals himself to you in the breaking of bread. But then they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. So they just went like seven mile journey and they're going back seven miles. So that's 14 miles. That's, that's a, pretty close to a, I mean, getting up there to a marathon, right? 26 miles, they just need 12 more and, and, and point one and they would get to a marathon of walking. And uh, that is a long, long time to walk. But they return immediately to Jerusalem because um, they wanted to tell the 11. And those with them assembled together and saying to them, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon and to us. Wouldn't, wouldn't that make sense? Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So they explain all of this and make it very clear that, wow, Jesus opened our eyes. He explained everything to us. He told us all of this. And some would even say that this explanation by Jesus of the, the scriptures um, is a way to um, walk from Genesis all the way through to the resurrection of Jesus and the eternal um, Revelation, you might say, that we are, we are going to see coming uh, later. Th th this is how scripture was written in the New Testament, that the people heard these stories and they continued to tell them so that when the, the apostles say, no, this is what Jesus was saying, and it ties all the way back, all the way back over here to Genesis, and this ties all the way back to Leviticus, and, and this ties back to um, Isaiah, when you hear that, you could maybe say that this was because Jesus told them that it is a direct connection, that this isn't them just pulling something and going, oh, it looks like, no, I, I'm going to guess that they held on to this message that Jesus gave them of where he is revealed in scripture and how, and that is where the gospels and all of the New Testament get their focus. So here we are to the Near, near end point of the message, or at least halfway. Um, and we're talking about faith challenges. We're looking at what it means to put this into practice. And I wanna encourage you today to consider these uh, and know, know this, that here again, I, I confess to you that this is just my take on this. I didn't have a direct message from Jesus except for through the, the scriptures, you know, as I read and, and through others who, who have read and studied and I've read some books, but, but you know, you, you might see things differently. And if you do, that's okay. And if you, if these don't seem to apply to you, then pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open your heart, open your eyes, and to give you something to apply this and carry it out today so that you can live more in line with Christ. So here's your faith challenges. One, walk with Jesus. What does that look like? What does that even mean? Well, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing, Believe that Jesus is there with you, helping you to understand, helping you to see what's going on. Sometimes that might mean walking on a beach and you're on, you know, a, a retreat with Jesus. But oftentimes it means walking through your daily life and your normal day-to-day -day activities and Jesus is still right there with you. But don't forget that Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. So even as we walk with him, we are carrying our cross because we haven't yet fully died to ourselves and been resurrected fully with him. I mean, we have, if we've been baptized, right? We die to ourselves in baptism and rise again to newness of life, but not completely because we're waiting for the day when Jesus returns and then we'll be resurrected like he has and that'll be complete new life. And we'll really walk and talk with him in a way that we can't now. But sometimes it also looks like this. Walking with Jesus might mean dancing with, with children. It might mean dancing with your neighbors. It might mean having fun and a, and, and, and a blast. Don't forget that Jesus was joyous and had fun and spent time with people in worship to his Father, just like us. And number two, eat with Jesus. At the end of Luke, we see Jesus opening their eyes through food, through the communion, through a, a time of a of a meal to remember him. And, and that's really what that little
passage is about here that we just read where he took it, he gave thanks, he broke it, and then he dispersed it. That is a communion moment. And it's in the communion that our eyes are open and we see Jesus for the first time, maybe every time. And so I want to encourage you. Some people say, oh, I can't take communion. Oh, I'm not worthy. Oh, I'm not good. You're right. But Jesus makes you good. He makes you good. And this isn't a, a special super, you have to be super holy to eat this. This is a, Jesus invites you to eat with him. He ate with sinners. If you say, oh, I'm a sinner. Exactly, Jesus ate with sinners. So sometimes eating with Jesus looks like communion. And sometimes it looks like communion with sinners. And opening up that communion in the idea of every time you eat a meal, Think about Jesus eating there with you and think about the people around you that you are eating with them, eating with Jesus. Because that's often how Jesus portrayed himself, or I should say Luke and the other gospel writers portrayed him throughout the gospels. He ate with sinners. He had fellowship with them. They got to know one another and they loved Jesus. So if sinners don't love you, you might have a little more work to do. If you are only comfortable around saints, then we got some work to do. We all need to be comfortable around sinners and saints because we're both. And we need to be with God, with Jesus, where he eats, with the less desirable people, because that's who he spent his life with. And three, love God and neighbor, because here's the thing. If your faith doesn't bring you into greater love of God and greater love of neighbor, then what are you doing? If you're walking and talking with Jesus causes you to hate immigrants, causes you to hate the poor, causes you to hate the elderly, causes you to hate people who don't look like you, causes you to hate anyone, then you're not doing it right. <laughs> because everything you do should draw you into deeper love with Jesus. And deeper love with Jesus means deeper love with all the people that he calls into himself. All the people. That means all people everywhere. Remember, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. That, that doesn't say the saved. It, it doesn't say the special. It doesn't say the church. It says the entire world. All the people and all of creation. For God loved all of them. He sent his son. He sent Jesus for the whole world. So Jesus and God, the Father and the Holy Spirit love everyone and we're called to do it too. So whoever's right in front of you, right beside you, right behind you, right around you, you love them. And you love them with the love of Jesus because that is what we're called to do, to love our neighbor as ourselves. So if this in any way has applied to you, I'm, I'm thankful and I'm grateful. If this has been a blessing to you, wow. Um, now we're going to close things down a bit and we're going to end with a, a prayer, uh, the Lord's Prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. And, and look at how this prayer is structured and base your prayers possibly upon it. Won't you pray with me? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As we continue to pray, Father, we ask that you would open our hearts to you, that you would show us how to love well. God, we know that we don't act fully and completely in line with you, but God, help us to center our being deep within your spirit so that your spirit speaks to our spirit and we learn how to live into your kingdom how to love like you love, how to love like Jesus loves. God, open our eyes that we can see. Open our eyes to life and health and eternity with you, the Father, Son, and Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now this is your invitation. If there's any way that we can bless you, help you, encourage you, if there's any way that we can pray for you, now's the time. Let us know. We would love to do that. If you need to put on Christ in baptism, we can work that out. We can get that done. There are so many creative ways to follow Jesus today, and we, we want to help you honor Jesus as, as you desire. Um, 
If you're not sure what that means and you have questions about all this and this doesn't make a lot of sense, my phone number is right there. That is my cell phone. It is my direct line uh, directly to me. You can call, you can text. I do answer that. Uh, if I don't answer right away, I'll get back with you. Keep in mind, this is live. So <clears throat> as we close out our service today, um, we have, I know that my Redeemer lives, and then I will look over the prayer requests that you've sent in, and then we'll sing Oceans to close. So I know that my Redeemer lives. I know. I know that my Redeemer that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know that over yonder stands a place prepared, a place prepared for me. A home, a home, a house not made with hands most wonderful to see. I know. I know that my Redeemer lives, that my Redeemer lives. So we had a prayer request come in from Kimberly for her health. I'm not seeing any others. Um, let me just look real quick. Uh, we'll pray for the Claudio's, Claudia's family. <clears throat> and uh, let's see here. Okay, it looks like I only have uh, I only have a few prayer requests here, so I'll be praying for uh, Greg and Lily and Mom. Good to see you, Greg, on here. And uh, let's see. All right. So let's pray. Keep sending them in, and I'll keep reading. Um, Father God, we thank you so much for the blessing of being together. We thank you for um, the opportunity to worship you today. We, we thank you for the honor of celebrating you every day as the risen Savior in our lives. God, let us live in a way that is powerful and true. Let us walk with you, eat with you, and as we walk and talk with others, um, God, give us a heart to, to bless them and to heal them and to help them. And God, let us pray for them with you because that is your desire that we would all be healed. God, we ask for Kimberly for her prayers for her health. Uh, we ask for Claudia uh, for her grandbaby. The, we, we are thankful that her grandbaby is healthy and, and doing well. We pray for Lily and her cancer and Greg and um, his mom there with him. God, we ask you for healing on them, on their, on their lives and pray especially for Lily and, and that you would do an amazing thing for her, that her heart would open, her mind would heal and that you would, uh, would bless her powerfully. But God, uh, whatever you desire, we want to honor you in our full life whether our prayers are answered as we would like or whether um, uh, they, they aren't answered that way. God, we, we long to live for you and we long to do that in every opportunity. So when we are suffering, God, help us to turn to you. When we are joyous, help us to turn to you. When, when life doesn't make sense, help us to turn to you because in that moment, you are already there with us and you are suffering alongside us and you understand the pain and heartache we've gone through and you want to walk us through that and bless us into an understanding of who you are, that our eyes can be open and we can see you anew. So God, let us see you with new eyes. Let us understand you in ways we haven't before. May you call us into deeper things, into deeper waters, into deeper places, into relationship with others, that their eyes might also be opened. 
God, help us to learn to lean on you, to walk with you. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. And here's our final song. You call me out upon the wall.